WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. And hi, this is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mikes. I'm Dr. Michael Crone. And I'm Dr. Mike Hargadon. I'm glad to be back. Back from where? Yeah, yeah, we're up here on the uh, on the slopes of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and uh, it's beautiful. Out. I think it's like 77 degrees today. The bees are all flying, and, um, I mean, it's this springtime. I got to tell you, there's a lot of people that when you say the bees are all flying, that's not really going to sound like a good thing to them. <laughs> well, <laughs> part of... Part of, part of our life concept is that uh, honeybees are essential for the life of many, many plants. In turn, they support human life. So, uh, so honeybees are an integral part of our life. Right, Mike? Still there? <laughs> honeybees yeah, yeah. are an important part of our life. <laughs> yeah, they are. I mean, look what happened over there in China. They uh, they lost all their honeybees and they had they had people climbing around in trees pollinating pears because they didn't have any bees to do it. They're running around with little feather dusters trying to pollinate the pear pear blossoms. So, I uh, I did not know that. Now it was only yeah. recently when I was reading a book on mostly another topic by someone who used to be a professional. Um, I don't know if the word is beekeeper. He would actually bring bees. You know, in California, they have such large fields of, of crops that you bring bees in when it's time to pollinate them. And then you yeah, collect them called, all up and you take them somewhere else when, you know, it's yeah. time to go somewhere else with them. And so he had that job. And prior to that, I didn't even know that that job existed. Yeah, it's called a migratory beekeeper. And what they'll do is, like on the East Coast, they'll follow the bloom as as the heat's up during the spring and into the summer the different crops like llama beans and all will bloom as they come up the coast. So they'll take a tractor trailer full of hives and, and leave them one place for a week, put them back on the trailer and then bring them up and then let them leave them another place for a week. And they'll go come right up the coast as the bloom comes up. That's, that's like a combination of what is at least soon to be the two of our lifestyles because you, Dr. Harbidon will be the beekeeper and I, Dr. Crow, will be the migrant. So between the two of us, some sort of um, amalgam that is not actually true would be a migratory beekeeper. There you go. Yes. I am such a dork. And, and, that, and the other, the other <laughs> note that, that the YBs really strike home on life issues is the other thing that was in the colony. And as soon as I got into the brood chamber, which is the deeper, deeper uh, hive box, uh, that's where they have the eggs and the young larva. Well, as soon as you get down in there, one false move and they start stinging. I mean, they don't sting me because I had gloves and all, but they sting the gloves and all. You get close to their kids, you get close to their young, and they get they get an attitude. Unlike people, I mean, you know, with with our abortion the way it is, uh, it's it's we can learn something sometimes from these bees. Yeah, well, I gotta say that that I was convinced that. And I can't remember what year it was. It's, it was sometime, I think, more than five years ago when I heard, um, I don't even think he was a priest yet, but who is now Father Paul Shank, talk at the Baltimore Cathedral on abortion. And the thing, the part of his talk that got me was that if you think long term, if you think, you know, like a century out, or if you think even, you know, 50 years out, it's two against human nature. So in that sense, we actually have something in common with the bees. It's two against human nature to really think that we're going to still have, you know, commonplace legal abortion. Because it's really not in our nature to be like that. And I would point out that if you look at even, you know, um, a, a pro-choice leaning group, but not, you know, uh, I don't know what to say. They weren't driving the message to have to be pro-choice, but they were pro-choice leaning. 
did a did a project called Sharing Our Stories, which was the stories of women who have had abortions. And I have to say that when I read those, it was very difficult to find one that didn't have a tinge that showed that this, even among the people who are mostly, although not entirely, people who are saying, you know, I want abortion to remain legal. It was very difficult to find a story that didn't have a tinge of regret or even that the abortion itself might have seemed like a good idea at the time, but they didn't realize, you know, the the emotional consequence of what they were really doing. So mm-hmm. I have to say that, you know, I, I talk, and, and on my website, which we're going to get at um, in the moment, I, I give an outline for a talk on why pro-lifers can and should expect more in the near term and why, you know, that is the strategy to getting more than I think most pro-life people imagine in the, the near term. But I think in the really long view, even if you assume that somehow the people now just completely fail and someone else has to start it from scratch a century out, it's just when I look at what, how humans are built, I don't think that abortion is still going to be there. Hmm. So let me, let me get into um, just I, I want to point out, I, I mentioned it on last week's show, on the website, which is up now at drmichaelcrone.com, I have the, a, the information that anyone listening will need to contact the 2016 Republican presidential candidates. So all the major candidates are listed. Um, Rand Paul's information is going to be added, especially because I know there's a lot of liberty people on this network. It's going to be added. He's, he's widely expected to announce tomorrow. And after he announces tomorrow, soon after, I should be able to find a campaign website. For most of the campaigns, they have a preliminary, what's called an exploratory committee or a PAC, and that exploratory committee or PAC, the contact information that I have for those are available on the website. And the point of this is what, what I want people to do is I want people to set a reminder in their calendar for just one time, once a week, I would say for for one contact, you shouldn't spend more than two minutes on this. Take one of the candidates, whichever one you think needs to hear from you the most, write some short one or two sentences. Think of it more like a text message than like, you know, a letter or a letter to the editor. Send it out to the campaign. The purpose of this is both to remind yourself to keep it in the equivalent, you know, just keep it running in your mind that the unborn have this problem and also to remind the campaigns of this. And part of why I only want you to take two minutes, I don't want this to become a project that becomes burdensome to do every week. I want you to be able to just sit down and to do it. And I also want to tell you, you know, sadly, most of the campaigns, if you get a response, it's more likely than not in my prediction that you're going to get a response that indicates that they didn't even read what you sent them. Um, Sadly, this is kind of the case for a lot of campaigns. Don't let that discourage you, but also that's a reason just to say what, you, say what your focus is, to say, look, the unborn, again, the, the most Im- impressive thing in America about the unborn is that the low that we're at, which is lower than it has been, is that 21% of the otherwise viable unborn were killed by abortion. That's a pretty dangerous place to be in your mother's womb in American society right now. And so, so it's not a, it's not a low percentage. It's just a low point for life. It's a low point. It used to be higher. It used to yeah. be up in the 30s. And in fact, Obama talked about how they had gotten. He focuses on the abortion rate because again, he doesn't focus on the unborn. He just focuses as if it was something that only affected the woman. The abortion rate is the number of abortions per woman, which has also gone down. The abortion ratio is basically the number of abortions per fetuses, which they're both down. Um, And when he talked about the abortion rate being down, he he almost took credit for it in his State of the Union last January. And when he talked about that, oh, like, that's great. Well, the low 
that we've gone down to is 21%. Hmm. So, and with that in mind, and I think the most effective thing, in addition to anything else that anybody listening might be doing, you know, in their spare time, you know, with 40 Days for Life or any of the other organizations or whatever, if they're students, you know, with maybe college pro-life clubs or other community organizations, is to just send something out to the campaigns. And even if you're not getting something, even if you get nothing back or if you get something back that so looks like they didn't read it, probably your comments are being tallied. They're being counted. This is also why I say just take two minutes. You know, just say, hey, what have you done for the unborn in the past week? Or even maybe like, I see that you have done X. I like it. Or you could send it to a different candidate. And I see that candidate X is doing such and such. That seems great. You know, what have you been doing? You know, and if you send just some short thing, whatever comes to mind and whatever comes to mind when the reminder comes out, as long as it says, hey, there are the unborn, remember the plight of the unborn, then, you know, you've done your job. And like I said, on DR for doctor, DR Michael Crone, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-C-R-O-N-E dot com, I have contact the candidates. It gives a description of sort of what the idea is, what you should be sending, and then it has a link to another page where I've compiled the contact information for, for the 2016 Republican presidential hopefuls. Hey, Mike, that sounds like a great idea. It's an it's a action, an action that people can get involved in. But uh, just for those who aren't number crunchers, when you say the abortion rate is 21 percent, does that mean 21 percent of the pregnancies end in abortion? That means, um, well, first off, the abortion rate is technically different than the abortion ratio. What I am quoting is the abortion, what is called, at least on Guttmacher, which is the research arm of Planned Parenthood on their website, what is called the abortion mm-hmm. ratio. And that is the basically what you said. And the only caveat that I would have is that miscarriages are not counted in the total either way. So it's really the percentage of otherwise viable fetuses percentages of fetuses that would have survived the pregnancy that didn't die of natural causes in the pregnancy that were killed by abortion. So it's not, it doesn't, two out of 10. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think two out of 10 abortion, two out of 10 pregnancies that would otherwise be a viable birth end in abortion. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Okay. And it was up in the thirties. I would say as recently as 10 years ago without having it in front of me. So it actually has gone down a lot, um, and there are some of the the laws that have gotten passed on the state level may be responsible for this, although I've also didn't notice when I looked at it without doing any fancy math that there was any kind of, you know, when you get your standard Republican versus your standard Democrat, and you went from, you know, W. Bush, George W. Bush to Obama, that you had any sort of blip in the numbers as if this had made any difference. And, of course, they were both funding Planned Parenthood, so it's not clear why that would be obvious. However, there has been a steady stream at the state level of various, um, I want to say, restrictions on the abortion, knowing that I won't be called to testify in the court where they'll say, oh, if it's a restriction on abortion, we can't allow it. But things that have put some, put some hoops in the way, and managed to save some children along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, so once again, it's drmichaelcrone.com. In about a minute, we're going to be going to break. When we come back from break, what I'm going to talk about is a review of what is called in, in the field, sometimes it's called um, public choice economics, a review of a book by an economist on how we um, make our political decisions. Um, stick with us. We'll be back in five minutes. This is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. And 
show that with licensed stuff with the Dr. Mike's. I'm Dr. Michael Crone. And I'm Dr. Mike Hargadon. I'm never going to get over that pun, I don't think. What's that? Dr. Mike's. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, well, it, it, you're, uh, it, you're, you're getting ready to head out on the road, ain't you, Mike? I am getting ready to head out on the road. I, I, um, I love the western United States in the summer. I'm going to see some uh, friends of mine in, in Alaska. I'm scheduling some talks to convince to pro-life groups to convince them to expect more and to show them at least the one way, you know, that we have to contact the candidates to, to expect more. And I am heading out from Maryland on Sunday, um, but initially – going to see some family and then heading out to, um, so going up to New England, which I had originally thought I'd be camping. We're going to see whether some of that is going to go away because I was just talking to my sister yesterday in Massachusetts on Easter, and there is a lot of snow in Boston still, or at least in Concord where she lives, and I think in Boston. Hmm. <laughs> so hey, we'll see. Um, actually, Vermont is a little further off the coast. It may have gotten less from those storms. So I'll just see what's predicted, and, you know, everything is flexible. And I am still flexible and available for and, – and Dr. Michael Crone has this – I has this um, – Dr. Michael Crone um, has a contact link to get a hold of me. If someone um, pretty much anywhere in the northern tier of the country or any anyone else you doesn't hurt to ask – or out west is interested in having me come talk to their organization. I can come out and talk. I generally don't charge an honorarium. The typical agreement is I don't charge an honorarium, but I will ask from the attendees for free will donations to um, basically keep me going. I am seeing if after finishing my PhD and with my experience as uh, your head pollster and also as a statistician Prior to that, working for nonprofits when I lived in Colorado and um, doing some interning as a statistician related to the presidential campaign in 2012. If um, uh, I cannot, re- I, I'm a professional talker. I forget why I was telling you that. Oh, if if um, <laughs> if through that background I can, you know, talk how through my statistics and social science why the pro-life people can expect more. Send me. Send me a uh, email, and then you know I will be happy to come out and talk to your organization and see if I can uh, see if I can schedule a time to get out there. Oh, that sounds good. So, so you you take it from a different perspective, kind of like what you were talking about last week, where you actually take the statistics and and it, and tell pro lifers that they should expect more. Right. It draws on. It actually draws on social science a lot more than statistics. In um, there is some, there are some base statistics by which I show that actually in the past five years or so, pro life has been mostly beating pro choice when asked. You know, do you consider yourself pro life or pro choice? And I use Gallup's numbers. There's a very similar poll that Fox News does as well, which has similar results. Um, and, but I also talk about why I give that poll. I talk about who we need to convince, who I call the mushy middle, which are the people who aren't necessarily really active or thinking about it one side or the other. They may even be active on other issues. And what we need from them, what we basically need from them, in my opinion, is them to like us more than the other side. Now, it's great if one of them joins us, but we don't need from most of them for them to join our side. What we need is for them to decide that we make more sense, um, that, you know, just in general we have more integrity than the other side. And the way to do that is not to do what has happened in some of the past campaigns where people have tried to be moderate to get through the election. The mushy middle is actually not really looking for specific, you know, moderate policies, typically. They are looking for integrity, and they, when asked, try and put themselves in the middle of whatever range they're offered. But in the campaign, you get to define, you know, you have the one side, you have the other side. 
And between that, they're stuck with the binary choice. There's no, you know, middle unless they choose not to vote, which most people don't want to do. Um, well, actually, people don't want to show up. But once they show up, they mostly don't want to choose not to vote. Um, and when they get there, what they're looking for is more integrity than just sort of, oh, well, now I'm in the general election. I should have different policies because that's where they poll us the middle. Does that make sense to you, Dr. Mike? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so so it ba it's basically that the people should stick to their positions and and not and not not hedge and you know just be if if you're pro life you should you should you should be pro life. Right. And when you're like that, what you find is more people start calling themselves pro life. And when they're not like that, when someone like for example, um, when Romney was running against Obama in the general election, and when he did not claim to be pro-life. Well, I won't say that. Okay, he did claim to be pro-life, but he did not stand for the pro-life position. He did not put out ads during their general campaign that highlighted or even argued or even really defended the pro-life position. Um, he basically tried to change the subject. And when you do that, especially... You know, when it's brought up, what people say is, oh, pro-life must not be a very good position. I mean, they're not even really, you know, I'm sort of getting at what maybe something in the inner psychology is coming up with. Um, but they come up with a view that, you know, the pro-life position is not necessary. Maybe they just get the idea that it's undesirable. But let me focus. I, I mentioned the mushy middle. And a lot of my talk talks about what we really need is to get the mushy middle to like us better than the other side. And what I'm going to give for what is probably going to take up the, the remainder of the show, and I'll call it a book review, I'm going to give a review of the book that I read, and I don't even think I saw it at the time, but that in retrospect is the book that gave me what I might call respect for the mushy middle. Um, about a month ago, I gave a talk to the George Mason University Pro-Life Club. And for that talk, I did a Google image search of typical voter. Those were the words I typed in. Um, I had to page down a couple times. First off, all of these images were, were basically saying that the typical voter didn't even care. Basically, and I, I agree with this, they, didn't care might be too strong, but the typical voter wasn't even really paying attention. And that is basically true. But what it took two or three page downs to actually get to something is something that wasn't insulting the typical voter for doing that. And so I am going to talk about why the book that taught me why it makes sense and why we should always expect that the typical voter isn't going to be paying attention. And in order to get there, it's not even really the main point of the book. Really, the main point of the book might be analogized to saying, hey, I wrote a book to prove to you that the sun is going to set tonight. It's proving what to the vast majority of people is absolutely known and obvious, as I demonstrated in the Google image search, where, you know, even the one I picked from like three pages down, it was saying, oh, well, this is, you know, the voter isn't paying attention, but at least it wasn't, you know, completely insulting to the voter, in my view, for not paying attention. So without further ado, the book that, that I am reviewing in the second half of this show is The Myth of the Rational Voter by Dr. Brian Kaplan. Um, so he calls it the myth of the rational voter. Now, the reason he calls it that is because he's an economist. And among economists, apparently it's very, and I say apparently, but actually it's very normal to model people in all ways as if they are completely rational, 
and have all the information. Actually, it, the, the cutting edge, as far as I can make out in terms of economic thought, is to say, okay, we're going to take this assumption because this is the assumption we've been working with. In all but this one area where I'm paying attention to, like maybe they don't have full knowledge, maybe they don't have, you know, maybe they're they're emotionally manipulated a little, but, you know, everything else is like this assumption. Sort of the default assumption is that everyone is rational, which to me is like saying the sun isn't going to set to most all of the general public. Most all of the general public has a feeling of the typical voter that's more like you know, the Google searches that I found, which is that the typical voter is, well, I mean, to use the word they might say, is something like an idiot. Um, and the reason uh, that this book, in the end, and I'll get to that, you know, in this, the second part, is that it, it gives an argument as to why the typical voter is like this. But first off, because he's talking to economists, he has to do a full book which says, oh, the you know voters actually are irrational. I I had not remembered. I was in his class. I took uh, this class to broaden my view, which related to fisheries, but anything political was useful to have the background for for any later work I have. Um, and when I was taking this class, he asked in a room where I think everyone else was an economics student, and I was the only you know math student in the room. He asked, and I had forgotten that this was his book. I hadn't started reading it yet. It was one of the assigned books. And when he was getting to this sort of area in his class, he says, who in this room would say, and I don't know if I have the exact quote, he might have said, would be willing to say that voters are irrational. There were probably, I'm not sure how many people were signed up for a class. I'm going to guess around 50. And I think I was the only person that raised my hand. So this is why, you know, it, it's sort of like, well, this is why the book, in a sense, needed to be written. Because for a certain audience, and even though it's written a little bit more for a public audience, it's at least talking as if you might respect economists on a lot of other issues. Why you should expect that voters are irrational. So it's, it's basically, the argument is, and it's not a particularly, in my view, even good argument for its thesis, which is one of the ironies of the book, in that he he looks at um, a survey that, that is, I believe, regularly done, called the Survey of Americans and Economists on the Economy. So it is like what it sounds. They asked economic questions of the general public and of economists, um, and in so doing, he finds, and, you know, this might not be a shocker to anyone, that the general public disagrees with economists on a number of economic issues. You know, they disagree with the economic experts on a number of economic issues. And the first argument he has to make is that, and he does make this argument, that it is not because they're economists, and as such have certain selfish interests. And he does this using statistical techniques that I'm not going to get into here, but he does it by modeling um, what he calls um, the enlightened public, which is it taking, so if you take someone of the general public and you can find, if you look at all this demographic information, an estimate of each um, characteristic, like whether it's your age, whether it's your income, and what effect that has on your policy. And the enlightened public are the people who would be economists, except their demographics are different. We'll be back. This is Licensed Stuff with Dr. Mike. Back in five minutes. Mike Hargadon. And Dr. Michael Crone. 
yes, yes. Are we yeah, still figuring I'm out when they when they actually come on? Because <laughs> did you hear me say we're yeah. back? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were just yeah, a little, wasn't you were just a little bit early. But I don't think anybody picked up on it. I, I've I've actually I've been sitting out for the them. last fifteen. Yeah, for the last fifteen minutes, I've just I've been entertained by Dr. Mike Crone, who uh, who is in fact a professional speaker. I mean, he he's been going on and on about this guy that wrote this book, and uh, and he's he's it's fascinating. So what were you you're, you're speaking of the myth of the rational voter by Dr. Brian Kaplan. So yes. to to bring people up to speed, if you've just come with us, so the myth of the rational voter is a book to demonstrate that voters are irrational, which, as I've said, is basically, so I think to a lot of people, like a book that's arguing that, yes, the sun is going to set. <laughs> Be prepared. It's going to get dark. Um, because, well, just as an example, in preparation for a talk I gave a, a month ago, I did a Google image search. I typed in typical voter. It took me two pages down or something like that before I got to where I found one that wasn't too insulting. <laughs> Most people think that the voter is, well, irrational might be the word, you know, that they, they're, they well, an idiot in their words. And what I want to do in the end of this book review is say what is in this book that brought me to say, brought me to respect the typical voter. Um, so, again, to bring people up to speed, it's an argument using a survey, the Survey of Americans and Economists on the Economy. Um, let me say that again. Survey of Americans and Economists on the Economy. So that's basically asking regular people, asking economists what they think about economic questions, big surprise, the typical person and the economist disagree. Um, there are some statistical techniques used to estimate whether this is due to some sort of self-interest type situation to be and based on being an economist because they may make more money or whatever, and he finds that that's part of the explanation but not really much of it. And then says, well, so they actually disagree with what the economists think, and it's not really their selfish interest. It's, you know, that's not enough to explain it. So we're going to declare that the voters aren't rational because they disagree with economists. And I'm not – I'm summarizing rather than giving everything he says. And to his credit, and one of the reasons why this – Dr. Kaplan has one of the two blogs that I read regularly is because he doesn't hold back on what he thinks. And he gives all the arguments he comes up with as um, contrary that he can come up with. But still, in the end, disagreeing with economists equals not rational. Well, in the end, it's not only an argument that the sun is going to set. It's not a particularly good argument that the sun is going to set. So I, I, it might be a good argument to economists. Because to them, it says, even by your own assumptions, um, what you're talking about doesn't work. In the sense of, you know, you're assuming that the voters are rational, but if they are rational, they should agree with us. Because, you know, obviously yes. we've thought this out and taken a lot of time and whatever to do it. And yet we have come up with... Um, uh, Lost my train of thought while I'm on the air. And yet we have come up yeah, with, but, you know, an argument that says, using our assumptions, the voters can't be rational because they disagree with us. Um, so for economists, you could say, well, something's got to give. And in the case of Dr. Kaplan, what gave is that the voters are rational. You know, he says, yes, economists. And he gives them, if you read the full book rather than get, you know, the 30-minute version, um, you'll find that he talks about why you should defer to experts. Um, and he makes some good points for deferring to experts. But in the end, I don't buy that just because, well, first off, I don't buy that the economists are necessarily the most relevant experts. There are many fields that could claim to be experts on what policies the government should have. 
Um, one of the things that prompts me to do this review, in addition to the moral that we as pro-lifers need to take out of it, is that just in the past week, on Dr. Kaplan's blog, there's a post called The Prevalence of Marxism in Academia. I would say, if you're going to say that economists are experts in how to run a society, certainly broad social science, you got to say, is, you know, the expert. You know, that's a plausible category. And what he looks at in this blog post is a 2006 survey, and Dr. Kaplan, I should point out, is... Uh, free market economist, and he finds that 18% of social science professors self-identify as Marxist. So if you're going to write a book that says, oh, the economists are experts on who to run society, then I don't see why you can't broaden it to social science. And then, unfortunately, you're going to get what you know, speaking myself and Dr. Kaplan, I would say, and especially reading from the blog post, wait, what's the quote he did? Um, Marxism is nonsense, to use his own word. You know, so he's finding that the experts, as in another reasonably defined way, believe nonsense. So just because you disagree with the experts doesn't make you irrational or mean that you should have to defer. Um, also, I think there are other categories. I mean, in theory, one could say, in fact, I could see a good argument on a lot of issues why the clergy are better experts if you have to defer to the experts on issues of government than any professor group. I mean, who is the group that has taken complex moral situations and tried to figure out how to live as a community under these circumstances. I would say you take any religion and you have a group of people that are following a tradition of being experts in that. So the general story of the book, voters are irrational because they disagree with economists could be expanded to voters are irrational because they disagree with social scientists and suggest that we should be more Marxist. It could be social um, voters are irrational because they disagree with the clergy, in which case I'm not even sure because I haven't seen a survey of the clergy in general. I know there's, there's plenty of, you know, I mean, what do Al Sharpton and Pat Robertson actually agree on? But if I saw a survey, I might get some idea as to where voters disagree. Um, but there is the kernel in this book that, in addition to, to all the other things in it, made me think, here is what happens when, even if you make a bad argument, as long as you're rational about it and looking at everything, some, there might be some diamond in the rough. And that is that once he decides that voters are irrational, even though, you know, most people already thought that, or once he possibly convinces other economists that voters are irrational, he talks about why. And in talking about why, what he basically says is, you know, it's going to take a certain amount of effort to be rational. In, in his view, it's basically because certain, certain views are more emotionally appealing they confirm your existing biases. Maybe they're flattering. Um, and in fact, I might say some are the ones that you would think intuitively until you actually search the information, although I don't think he puts as much emphasis on that as another reason why you might be biased before you actually um, you know, put some time into it. And if you actually think about it rationally, given the amount of importance a single vote has, it probably isn't worth the cost. Given that the voter knows that when they go to the polls, there's going to be a whole bunch of other people voting out going to the polls, it's not going to be worth the cost of doing, you know, I mean, how much research to do a completely educated vote, say, say even where we were talking earlier in this show about the 2016 Republican primary, 
if I were to research enough to be able to answer all the questions, maybe the questions in this book in terms of what the candidates think on them, how much time is that going to take from me? And even as someone in politics, these are questions that weren't particularly of importance to me, so maybe I won't come up with the right view. And hey, Mike, the Mike can just throw, you know, you know, you know, there's a, the most rational man I've ever read on his blog is uh, Lou, you know, uh, you know, LRC and, Lou Rockwell. and his Lou Rockwell. And, and he has he has resigned not to vote. He 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 says he sees no value in voting. So may, maybe he's so rational that he's seen through this and, and figured that the amount of research and the and the effect of your vote is at the point where. It, it's, it makes no sense to vote. That's what most economists will tell you if you actually get them down to it is the rational thing to do, even though that isn't. I, I believe it is addressed at some point, but I don't have a section on that um, highlighted in the sense of having pulled a page number out just because it is fairly complete. I would say that I do not think the right thing to do is to not vote, because I think in collective action problems like voting, you have to act as if a bunch of other people are going to act the same as you. But I think that we need to respect the people that are going to vote and are not doing a whole lot of research or certainly not doing a whole lot of activism or getting out there and campaigning for the politicians or campaigning for the uh, for the pro-life movement, because for most people, they are busy. Not just the pro-life movement, but many other positions have people demanding their attention because it's super important. And in some cases, it really is the issue itself is important. And we need to understand that what we really need from the mushy middle, it's great if they sign up and join us, but most of the time what we're going to get and all we're going to need to win is for them to like us better than the other side. And it is a basic principle of marketing that it is very difficult to market to a group that you don't like and respect so for the pro-life, for pro-life activists like us, if you don't respect the mushy middle, it's going to be very hard to convince them, even so much as when they get to the polls, when they have to choose in that binary choice, you know, usually binary. I know there's the whole third-party thing, but we've only got a minute or two left in the show. Um, but when they have to vote, and it's what most of the voters view <laughs> as a binary choice, um, then they, we need them to pick us. And if we don't respect them and understand why it's probably never going to happen that most of them or even a large percentage of them will suddenly become active, then we will never be able to bring them over to our side, or at least it'll be very difficult. Respect them. So you so what you're saying is they are the mushy middle, and we may not think that they're doing enough or doing anything, but at the same time, you need to respect them so that they trust you and like you and, and, and appreciate your opinion. Right. And respect that they may not have, they have a number of things demanding their time. And we can't expect them to necessarily say, oh, well, we need to suddenly drop everything and do this. This has been Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. Come back next week.